In any list of the best aircraft carriers, the unfortunate Bayarn will often fall towards the bottom, if not at the bottom, depending on how much the list creator dislikes the French. This isn't terribly surprising. Bayarn was an experimental aircraft carrier. Even under that limitation, she was still underwhelming. The French ship doesn't do well in comparisons with any contemporary ship outside maybe USS Langley or HMS Argus, which is not a high bar to cross. There are reasons for this, of course. The French economy and industry was a mess after the Great War. Bayarn was also built off of a relatively small and slow battleship hull. That wasn't a great base to build off of to begin with. All of these justifications are there, but they don't change the fact that Bayarn was far from the best design easily seen in the fact she never saw combat. Even when the Second World War broke out, Bayarn was used as a transport, not even as an escort carrier. Let's look at her story now, beginning, of course, with the design. Laid down on January 10th, 1914, Bayarn began her life as one of the Normandy-class battleships. However, she would not be completed as one. As you can see from Bayarn's start of construction, the Great War intervened. The first four ships in the class would be launched in 1914 and 1915. Construction was, however, suspended soon after they entered the water. Very little work was done after their launch. The workers were needed elsewhere, including the front line. Ultimately, the first four ships would be scrapped in the 1920s. The French economy couldn't handle finishing them, be it to the original design, or with modernizations. That left Bayarn, which had also seen her construction grind to a halt. In fact, the ship was only launched on April 15th, 1920. And even then, she had barely been worked on. The ship had been launched to clear the slipway, not to be completed. Around this time, however, the French visited HMS Argus. This naval delegation studied the British ship and how she operated her aircraft. The experience gave the French ideas that eventually coalesced into Project 171. This was a plan to convert one of the Normandies to an aircraft carrier. An ambitious plan, considering the economic situation at the time, but one worth looking into. As such, the French Navy took Bayarn's incomplete hull and ran tests on her. The ship was only completed up to her lower armor deck, but that was enough to put a wooden platform aboard for landing trials. While these trials went well enough, the French still hadn't decided, for sure, what they wanted to do. Some circles still wanted Bayarn as a battleship, others wanted her as a carrier. Eventually, all of these arguments would be put to bed by the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922. The new naval limitations saw the French decide on the aircraft carrier route. Although the Normandy design, as a slow and small pre-war battleship, was not the best fit for this. Bayarn would be chosen over her sisters for one major reason. Her lack of completion was a good thing for the purposes of converting her. It was cheaper to convert a less complete ship than to tear off parts of a further along ship, at least when you're talking ships that had already been launched. In any event, Bayarn was earmarked for conversion on August 4th, 1923. This would see a 180-meter, or 590-foot-long flight deck, put aboard the ship, with a width of 27 meters, or 88 feet. To service this flight deck, Bayarn was fitted with three electric elevators. In a sign of how experimental this design really was, those three elevators were each intended for different aircraft. The foremost was only meant for fighters. The middle elevator, meanwhile, was meant for reconnaissance aircraft while the third, sternmost elevator was meant for torpedo bombers. When looking at the ship from above, you can easily see the difference in size of the elevators. These were also slow affairs, with the middle elevator needing three minutes to cycle. The aft elevator was worse, requiring five minutes to cycle. And on top of that, they were badly designed. The larger elevators had clamshell doors and the forward elevator was a very weird-looking design in its own right. Now, when it came to hangar space, Bayarn was similar to British design in having a double hangar layout. However, the lower hangar 
was entirely dedicated to workshop space and storage. Only the upper hangar handled aircraft. Bayarn was, at least as designed, intended to operate up to 32 aircraft. This number was rarely met, and as planes got larger, would have shrunk even further. As for the rest of the design details, let's look at that in order, from weaponry to armor to propulsion. When completed, Bayarn was armed with eight 155mm, 6.1-inch guns, and casements at the corners of the superstructure. To support those guns, Bayarn also carried six 3-inch guns, eight 37mm weapons, and a dozen 8mm machine guns, all normal to this point. But then some bright spark thought, hey, why not put torpedo tubes on our aircraft carrier? As a result, Bayarn was fitted with four above-water 21-inch torpedo tubes. For purely defensive purposes, Bayarn's armor was 3.3 inches at its thickest. The original battleship scale protection was removed. And, to round things off, Bayarn could reach a speed of 21.5 knots. That was already becoming slow for battleships, let alone an aircraft carrier. Even this speed would be problematic, however, because Bayarn's power plant was a mixed affair. One set of turbines, and two triple expansion engines. The latter vibrate terribly when pushed to max power for long periods of time, not exactly ideal for steaming into the wind or keeping up with the fleet. Another interesting feature is visible on the side of the ship, that being this big bulge. This was intended to mix the exhaust with cooler air to reduce turbulence over the flight deck. Evidently, it didn't work very well. With that said, though, we reach the end of this long design description. However, Bayarn needed it because her service history is not exactly the most exciting affair. The newly converted ship would only be commissioned on December 5, 1927. Trials would last until May 1, 1928, when she formally entered service. 1928 through 1934 with the exception of refits and port visits, was spent entirely on training. Bayarn would specifically train pilots, although she often carried less planes than her actual design loadout. At one point in late 1928, the ship only had seven pilots aboard. Her aircraft were often in short supply or outright broken down. Her ability to operate with the fleet, a crucial part of naval aviation, was also limited. On the first fleet exercise, Bayarn turned into the wind to launch aircraft. All well and good. However, this slowed the ship down, while the rest of the fleet continued on. It took Bayarn over an hour, steaming at 16 knots, to catch up to the fleet, which was steaming at 12 knots. Aircraft carriers really need to be faster to catch up in that kind of scenario. Bayarn was, at absolute best, the same speed as the French battleships. With these limitations in mind, Bayarn would receive two early refits. Between 1928 and 1929, these focused on her aviation equipment. They angled down the bow and stern to make landing easier, which is very easy to see in pictures of the ship. The arrestor gear was replaced as well. What wasn't done was any changes to the machinery, which is something that would come back to bite the ship in the 1930s. For now, Bayarn completed her second refit in April of 1930, and promptly returned to much the same duty. She sailed around the Mediterranean, visiting various ports, and training her pilots. Nothing particularly extraordinary, but perfectly fine for a ship like Bayarn. However, things would soon sour for the carrier. By the end of 1932, Bayarn was only capable of 15 knots. This had been recognized as early as 1931. The ship's power plant was in bad shape. The French Navy worked up a refit plan that would replace the boilers, modify the forward elevator, and replace the three-inch guns with more modern models. There were even talks of new turbines, torpedo bulges, and deck armor. None of these came to anything. The French government, very cash-strapped, didn't see the point. No amount of refits would turn Bayarn into an effective combatant. She could never keep up with the new Dunkirks, let alone cruisers. So a cheaper option was taken. 
Bayarn receives six new boilers, improvements to her funnel system, and the removal of the torpedo tubes. The 8mm machine guns were also replaced by six twin-mounted 13.2mm guns. Furthermore, her directors were upgraded, and new rangefinders were put aboard for the anti-aircraft weapons. This refit lasted from February of 1934 through to November 1935. By the time it was done, Bayarn could manage her old top speed of 21 or so knots. That alone was worth the effort. However, her career didn't really change much. Bayarn continued training, including testing an autogyro and a Potez 565. The latter was the first time a twin-engined aircraft took off from an aircraft carrier in 1936. In general, however, the 1930s were wrapped up fairly quietly. Not much of note beyond training and the odd refit. This wouldn't change much when war arrived in September of 1939. Bayarn spent the final months of 1939 and the early months of 1940 hanging around France, first for modifications to fuel seaplanes, and then for testing new aircraft. While she was, on paper, available for hunting German raiders, this never came to pass. In fact, when the Germans invaded France in May of 1940, Bayarn was still in French waters. The carrier was promptly assigned to an important mission, that didn't require her aircraft at all. Bayarn was loaded up on May 18th with 147 metric tons, or 162 tons, of French gold. This was destined for the United States to pay for American aid. With the gold aboard, Bayarn sailed across the Atlantic. She would arrive with her escorts in Halifax on June 1st, 1940. The gold was offloaded at that point, and Bayarn was loaded up with American aircraft for France and Belgium. However, France surrendered before the ships could arrive home. Bayarn and the cruiser Jean d'Arc were diverted to Martinique on June 27th. They joined several other French ships in what amounted to an American-dictated internment. Bayarn offloaded the aircraft and kind of sat about, for most of the war at that. With the exception of brief voyages to Guadalupe, in May and August of 1941. This was not kind on Bayarn. For example, in December of 1941, a diver found one of her propeller blades had fallen off. The ship was immobilized further, with four of her boilers disabled and most of her fuel offloaded in mid-1942, in addition to much of the weaponry being pulled off the ship. This was due to the frosty relations between the United States and the Vichy government. When those relations went from frosty to outright hostile in the aftermath of Operation Torch, Bayarn suffered for it. The Vichy government ordered the ships in the Caribbean sabotaged in May 1943. While Bayarn initially avoided this fate, the ship was finally run aground on May 19th. Further acts of sabotage saw her machinery space half-flooded on July 3rd. Unfortunate for the French, really, because the French Caribbean holdings Join the Allies on July 14th. Bayarn would be refloated by the Free French on September 8th as they reclaimed their ship. By this point, she had been stripped to the bone and was showing her age. While initial refits in Puerto Rico at the end of September got the ship moving again, well, Bayarn wasn't good for much at that point. The old carrier sailed to New Orleans on December 3rd, 1943. After her arrival, the French and Americans put her through a conversion to an aircraft transport. By 1944, the U-boat menace was largely handled. Bayarn was too old and outdated to bother converting to an escort carrier with all the purpose-designed ships floating around. So the French decided to just keep using her for what she was going to do before the surrender. This refit concluded on December 30th, 1944. Bayarn was now equipped with new American-designed weaponry and radar. Her speed, already sluggish, was reduced even further to just under 18 knots. The sad thing is that even after this refit, Bayarn didn't amount to much. The ship didn't sail on her first voyage home until March 7, 1945, where she promptly collided with a troop ship on March 13th. Bayarn would need further repairs, lasting until July 30th. 
and she wouldn't actually return to France until August 3rd, 1945. By which point, well, even the Pacific War was soon to come to an end. Bayarn had missed the vast majority of the Second World War, and her post-war career wouldn't be much more exciting. The old carrier was used to transport men and material to French Indochina in the immediate post-war years, before being assigned as a submarine tender in 1948. This would last until 1960, at which point Bayarn was converted into a barrack ship. This kept the antique ship around for a few more years, until in 1967, Bayarn was finally towed off for scrapping. A long career for a ship that was of dubious utility when she first entered service. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.